Yeah, it'll work. Ladies, gentlemen, and kids, hopefully we have some kids here to continue our heritage. Uh, welcome to the annual Armstrong Festival, put on by the French Quarter Festivals, Inc. This is, of course, the Hilton uh, Satchmo Legacy stage. Uh, and welcome again. A uh, special shout out to our friends, Chevron, major, major sponsor, and the Hilton Hotel chain, of course. This event is produced by French Quarter Festivals, Inc., a nonprofit organization showcasing New Orleans culture and heritage since 1984. This event is made possible through sponsorship of community-minded organizations and the sale of Abita, Jack Daniels, Sonoma Couture, Corbel, Tequila Herradera, Finlandia, Pepsi. Oh, I didn't make the announcement. That's all right. That's all right. We, we live in this new world of tech. I, I remember the days of eight tracks, so, you know, we... Uh, <laughs> all right, very well. So let's take a second and uh, turn your cell phones off. You're getting nervous? <laughs> oh, qu'est-ce que c'est? Qu'est-ce que c'est? <laughs> yes, you can, always, you can always pitch it out the window like network. Yes, there we go. All right, cell phones are off? Okay, as we were saying, please support your festival by uh, in, in indulging in uh, the wares of these sponsors. And... <clears throat> Uh, our beverage and merchandise booths outside around the Mint. They help support our uh, recycling, EMS, and production costs. Uh, please support your festival by purchasing from these, uh, these entities. Do your part to keep the festival clean by using recycling and trash containers on site. And support our recycling efforts by purchasing a reusable souvenir cup at our beer and cocktail booths. And please, enjoy responsibly. Special thanks to the Satchmo Legacy stage contributors, Hilton, Harris, New Orleans, Joseph K. and Inez Eichenbaum Foundation, the Ella Fitzgerald Charitable Foundation, the Barbershop Harmony Society, the Fertel Foundation, Ricky and Vicky Nurigan, and Andrea Duplessis. And thank you all for being here, and thank all of our sponsors, including, once again, Chevron, Brown Furman, Abita Brewing Company, GE, Fidelity Bank, WWL, Offbeat Magazine, and so many, many, many more. Pick up a schedule for the full uh, events of all performances and the culinary lineup. So, grab a bite before the next act begins. Of course, don't leave right now. And stop by the merchandise tent to purchase the official Satchmo Summerfest poster, shirts, and souvenirs. I just saw a wonderful shirt with, uh, it's this fly kind of white shirt with the uh, Satchmo logo on it. I don't know if you can get that. I think they have a new version this year. I'm just saying some wonderful garments and merchandise out there. Without any further ado, make some noise for Paul Carr. Good morning. The two words that musicians rarely get to <laughs> utter when coming on stage. I stole that from uh, John Pizzarelli. Um, so I'd like to, is, is the volume okay on this? Yeah, okay, I'd like to uh, start out with uh, a few shout outs to number one, Lewis Russell, my father-in-law, without whom I would not be here. Um, and number two, my wife, Catherine Russell, that's how Lewis became my father-in-law, I married his daughter. Um, Catherine's an amazing jazz vocalist. You've you know, gotten to hear her present in past years and she couldn't make it this year because she was offered some festival work in Europe and was like really seriously bummed that she couldn't come here but we had to ask ourselves what would pops do so she she's in you know Sardinia Mallorca Paris oh well <laughs> it's, it's it's tough life someone's got to do it <laughs> and then I, I'd like to shout out to um, my good friend Ricky Riccardi and congratulate him on his Spirit of Satch Award. And thank you. And, and, and for all of his help in this presentation and everything. In fact, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if the D Dippermouth blog hadn't you know, come up through a Google search of Lewis Russell and then 
we met and, and you know, the rest has been an amazing friendship. So thank you, Ricky. So how many people are here for Hoagie Carmichael? Ah, okay. Well, Hoagie Carmichael has a special place in my heart. Um, when I was a little kid, maybe five or six years old, be on family trips, the three, three kids in the back seat, mom and dad would be trying to keep us out of mischief, and they'd, they'd sing, and they, they were fans of swing era and the American songbook, and I remembered, you know, blue skies up above, everyone's in love, up a lazy river. So that was, you know, in my consciousness from uh, an early age. I didn't know it was a Hoagie Carmichael tune. Um, then in 2006, Catherine was invited to sing at a jazz festival, well, it was a world music festival in Bloomington, Indiana. And the promoter said, you know, uh, you, you really should um, go and visit Hoagie. What, where? Well, there's a cemetery out, uh, you know, in the part of town. You can walk there from your hotel. So we, it was a sunny day, and we made a pilgrimage and walked through the headstones, and it was way at the back of the cemetery, nice headstone, Hoagland Carmichael. So we, we paid our respects. So Louis Armstrong, the performer, charmed and conquered the world with songs by Hoagie Carmichael. Hoagie's songs were pillars of Armstrong's repertoire. In fact, he was the second most covered composer um, next to Fats Waller. Louis Armstrong recorded 13 Hoagie Carmichael tunes and 14 Fats Waller tunes. And his, you know, his repertoire always from 1929 till the end of his career was filled with Hoagie Carmichael tunes. And sometimes he would do a radio show, f five tunes, or a major concert or a TV show, and three or four of them would be Hoagie tunes. So, Hoagland Carmichael, born in Bloomington, Indiana, in 1899. Hoagie's songs, uh, what he liked to write about, uh, one of his m big subjects was writing about black folks, and his songs became vehicles for breaking barriers and creating a place at the table for all Americans. And it, it's interesting to read some of his letters, which I'll do in a, in a little bit, about some of his early influences. But Hoagie was a songwriter first and foremost. He was also a pianist, singer, an actor who appeared in countless Hollywood films with major stars like Lauren Bacall. And he developed a persona, kind of a hip, laid-back, singing piano man, smoking a cigarette, with a deep affection for American culture and African-American culture. And to him, they were the same. So it's really difficult to overstate the importance of Hoagie to American popular song in the first half of the 20th century and to Louis Armstrong and the songs endure to the present. And so Carmichael's songs were, like Louis Armstrong, optimistic, inclusive, and universal. According to John Hassey, the jazz curator at the Smithsonian, Hoagie Carmichael was, quote, a musical Will Rogers, a musical Democrat, whose music was accessible, one of America's most appealing and visible composers who often sang his own songs with a modest but genial voice with heartland good looks, becoming the first major singer-songwriter of the mass media age, the age of radio, film, and television. So in a letter that he wrote in 1936, he, he, he was promoting himself to a, a publicity and radio guy at Sears Roebuck and Company, and he talked about how he started in music, and he said, my mother supplied me with the fundamentals of playing piano by ear, as she did. So his mother played for dances, and of his early piano playing, he wrote, I banged away at it playing all the fast one steps I could remember, including a couple of jazz regs written by Reggie Duval, the then hottest piano player in Indianapolis, colored. He was a friend of mine, 
and had given me several pointers. So when he was starting out, he was, he was learning on the piano and playing songs by, by uh, what he called a colored piano player. Those are the compositions that informed his, he was a self-taught musician. How did he come up with the, the, the harmonic chord changes? He had unusual song structures like Stardust. Where did he come up with those melodies? Well, he, he in promoting himself, talked about, I got a lot of good ideas from the colored piano players who came to Bloomington to play dances. I heard, like Reg Duvall, he's an Indianapolis Negro. So then Hoagie, you know, living in Bloomington and back and forth between Indianapolis, started to study law, and he was kind of leading a dual life in law school, and then he'd, he'd sneak off to Indianapolis to the, the Bucktown section, which was the black section of Indianapolis, and listen to jazz and blues bands play. Which brings us to, actually this, so this song was the impetus for my doing this presentation. Um, recorded by Louis Armstrong in December of 1929. And when I was studying jazz history, I came across an article by a writer named Jennifer Griffith. It was written in 2010. Um, and the title was Mingus in the Act of Confronting the Legacies of Vaudeville and Minstrelsy in a serious scholarly magazine, Jazz Perspectives. And in this article, Jennifer makes the statement that in the verse of the 1929 recording of Rocking Chair, Armstrong plays the plant plantation slave to white Hoagie Carmichael's master. And that really pissed me off. I was like, what? Th there is nothing in the lyric of the song or in the performance of the song, anything that would suggest that. So, you know, we, we have to really ask ourselves if, if, if the song wasn't about a, a, a slave and, and the slave master, what is it about? Well, the song is a conversation between an elderly father and his son. Carmichael, in this case, wrote both the lyric and the music. He often collaborated with lyricists, but some of his greatest songs, he wrote both lyrics and music. This was one. And the father is in failing health and about to meet his maker, the universal human predicament growing old and facing death. And it's given over to metaphors. The rocking chair is old age, perhaps. Grabbing flies, the futility of trying to control nature. Have you ever tried to grab a fly? Not so easy. And Harriet, these are some of the characters in this song. And Harriet is family. The cabin could be the body from which there's no escape. Gin is a metaphor for gin. Or, or water, I don't know, you, you, you can pick. And the chariot is, is a ride to the great beyond, to heaven. Now, since we, uh, you know, we decided the song is not about uh, a slave and a slave master, the real significance of this session is this was the first recording of a vocal duet of a black singer and a white singer in the history of recorded music in December of 1929. Now, you have to use firsts with caution when you're a historian. So I know there are a lot of scholars and historians and fans and knowledgeable people out there, so I'm throwing it out to you. Let me know. Was this the first? And you can contact me privately um, if you have an answer to that. So it's pretty incredible that, you know, 15 or even 20 years into recording, 10 years after Mamie Smith had a big hit record with Crazy Blues, creating a market for race records, all this recording is going on. Hoagie was talking about hanging out with black musicians in the late teens in Indiana and colored bands coming up from Louisville, and that was his inspiration. And it took until the end of the, the so-called jazz age, the roaring 20s, for, for something like that to happen. So that is pretty amazing. And 
let's uh, look at the, the Motley Crew, where Hoagie Carmichael kind of stepped in, and according to Charlie Holmes, who was um, the sax player in Lewis Russell, this is the Lewis Russell Orchestra with Louis Armstrong in 1929, or it could have been sometime in, in that year. Um, and, you know, Hoagie kind of knocks on the door, and Charlie Holmes said, we, you know, Lewis Russell recording sessions weren't, usually were very well planned in advance when they did their own records, but Louis Armstrong came from Chicago in 1929. The record label they were both on put them together and said, record some tunes. And so they had this session planned, and the, guy, the door knocked, and Hoagie Carmichael walks in, and he says, I got this tune. He has a lead sheet. He has no arrangement. So on the spot, Lewis Russell writes an arrangement, and they record Rocking Chair. They did two takes probably because they needed to rehearse it. Um, and so this is that 1929 recording. Hoagie, in his own words, from a letter in 1933, I knew Louis Armstrong, and when he came to New York, I got together with him to record Rocking Chair for OK. We did a vocal duet on the thing, and the record was well received. Southern Music Publishing Company published it. I had taught the tune to Mildred Bailey while in Hollywood, and she used it as a theme song when she went on the air. And then 
a, another letter in 1936. Again, Hoagie's promoting himself. Then came Rocking Chair, the inspiration for which was an old colored fellow who lived in Bloomington from whom I bought my homebrew beer. This was 1927, and although a few bands around Chicago and Detroit played the song, nothing was really done with it until 1929 when I made a record of it with Louis Armstrong in New York. As soon as the record came out, the publisher, who had the number on the shelf for a couple of years, realized he had a good thing and went to work on it. So right after that recording, everyone started recording Rocking Chair. Um, Paul Robeson recorded Rocking Chair. There were gazillions of versions and gazillions of versions by Louis Armstrong for the rest of his career. The interesting thing to, to me about Hoagie's letters is that he is promoting his indebtedness, indebtedness to black music and felt that those associations bestowed a certain authenticity upon his own work as a composer and as a piano player. And in that sense, he was, he, he was among many other white musicians, celebrities, actors who shared that indebtedness. And so after recording Rocking Chair in 29, um, Armstrong leaves New York, goes back to Chicago, and he's recording with an orchestra there. And in November of 1931, in kind of quick su succession, he really jumps all in on the Hoagie Carmichael bandwagon and records um, Georgia, Stardust, and Lazy River. Um, this photo is signed in February of 1932, best wishes to my boy, Hoagie Carmichael from Louis Armstrong. So I, want, I chose to play you one of those recordings and the one I chose is Lazy River because it's, it's such a deconstruction and a, original take on the tune. And uh, here it is.
The study of history enables us to find our identity, to learn about who we are. We can look back and see the things that divided us in the past and see how artists with imagination and courage overcame obstacles, as did Louis Armstrong and Hoagy Carmichael, and the struggle continues. And on that very serious note, we come to one of the major stars of the 1930s Hollywood films, Mae West, who appeared in 1934. And she had a lot of clout. She wrote scripts to her, her movies in Belle of the 90s. And she's a pretty hip singer. And she sings Memphis blues and mild flame in the film, accompanied by the Duke Ellington Orchestra, and also a version of Troubled Waters, which Ellington later recorded with Ivy Anderson. I'm just giving this as an example to lead into the next Mae West part, and also because her best line in all her films is from this movie, where she's surrounded by male suitors and says, I'd rather be looked over than overlooked. <laughs> so in 1937, Armstrong uh, appears in a uh, another Mae West feature, Every Day's a Holiday, performing the Hoagy Carmichael composition, Jubilee. Here's a little mashup from, from that film. And when you, when you hear the opening drum roll played by Paul Barberin, great New Orleans drummer and the Lewis Russell Orchestra, it was like I was in the green room getting ready to come here and I heard on the street same thing. Join the Jubilee, gather on the run, we a lot of fun, singing in the sun. Oh, Jubilee, come and join the Jubilee, listen to the band, swinging in the land, everybody stand. Won't you sing, with a zip and zing, watch blues go beam, make raptors ring, up to heaven, Jubilee, kind of full of joy. Mr. Bloom won't be about Music always knocks him out Learn a song that you can shout And join Jubilee
once again a carnival of joy. Have a lot of fun singing in the sun. Watch the blues go bing. Mr. Gloom won't be about music always knocks him out. Learn a song that you can shout and join the Jubilee. It's an invitation to, to fun. In 1939, Paramount Pictures made a, a nine-minute feature film about Hoagie Carmichael, which I think is pretty revealing um, uh, in terms of how, he, how the studio may have wanted to view him and market him. Um, and, it, and he performs with Jack T. Arden, Louis Armstrong's favorite musician and sidekick. So let's take a look at this. Out here at Paramount, we receive a lot of fan mail about our musical pictures. And curiously, much of this fan mail asks for the melodies of one certain composer, a man whose music seems to appeal to everybody, everywhere. So here is our answer. We give you a band selected by the composer himself, one of the newer bands, headed by America's great trombonist, Jack Teagarden. We give you some of the composer's outstanding hits. And not only that, we give you the composer himself, Hoagie Carmichael. Gotta get going, or I'll be late. So, Klondike, let's don't stall. Now, so Paramount won't like that at all. Say not. Do 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 And now, Miss Meredith Blake. Singing your very latest song written especially for this picture. That's right. I'm wrong. That's right, I'm wrong for loving you after you have forgotten me. That's right, I'm wrong for telling you about a romance that just popular Carmichael hits, inspired by familiar characters of the Deep South, have become modern American folk songs. First, Washboard Blue.
Listen here to me. You didn't play that part, Jack, the way that we agreed. If you just let me play my style, I'd make your tune sound worthwhile. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Don't bother me. If you just slide to the right spot, this song would sound mighty hot. And then we'd be her real success. Yeah? Yeah. Now, look here, small guy. Your music's not hot. It's frostbitten. Frostbitten? Why, man, what you should do is play it... As written. My, 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 what a big shot way to speak. Why, you haven't had a hit now in a solid week. You practice trombone all day long, and you still can't play my song. No, 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 Hoagie, that's not quite true. I think so. I can rock old rock in chapel you. So I'm going to, um, the next number, Meredith Blake sings Stardust, and Hoagie plays some amazing piano, but in the interest of um, fitting in a few more clips, um, I wanted to, I look for examples of, in the swing era, other films that may have featured um, a duet between uh, a, a black singer and a white singer, and I found this one in 1941, uh, Gene Krupa, who al always talked about his indebtedness to Baby Dodds and to black musicians, hired Roy Eldridge to uh, play in his band and did it sound both soundies and feature films. Th th this is a soundie. I feel 
feel something. What you feel, Roy? The heat? No, it ain't the heat. It must be that uptown rhythm. Because I feel like blowing. Well, blow, Roy, blow! So, you know, had uh, Armstrong and Carmichael not recorded Rocking Chair together in 1929, this wouldn't have been possible. And, you know, there, there are lots of other examples now in the swing era. Benny Goodman hired Gene Krupa, and then he hired Teddy Wilson, Lionel Hampton, Charlie Christian. Krupa went off, started his own band. And in addition to this soundy, he did a major... Um, appeared in a major Hollywood romantic comedy, which I encourage you to seek out. It's called Ball of Fire, starring Gary Cooper and Barbara Stanwyck, in which he performs what was a hit song in 1943, Drum Boogie, which he Krupa actually co-wrote with Roy Eldridge. And Eldridge, you know, stands up and he's like the speck of, of, of darkness in a sea of white, which is often the, the case in, in these instances. So I, I decided... Is there a, a case of a, a white person stepping into a black person's, you know, c casted film? And I found a little clip from a musical comedy from 1947, Boy, What a Girl, which was an all-black cast, and it was a feature film uh, with a lot of great jazz in it. Look that one up, too. And uh, in, in this scene, Gene Krupa is leading uh, kind of a bebop-ish band. And see what happens. I want you to do the same for me in one of my pictures. Will do. Solid. I, I love the ending of that. I want you to do, do the same for me in one of my pictures. Solid. Fast forward now, 10 years later, uh, major TV show, the Timex All-Star Jazz Show, a series of four shows from 1957 to 59, four episodes, Featuring a wide array of artists, Louis Armstrong, Gene Krupa, Lionel Hampton, Chico Hamilton, Anita O'Day, Hoagie Carmichael, who hosts one episode and does a medley of his songs with everyone sitting around the piano. And um, Armstrong sings snippets of Rocking Chair, Georgia, Lazy Bones, and joins in the grand finale of Lazy River in that episode. But I'm going to 
have to play this episode. hard to top that. Uh, just a concluding thought. 
Hoagy Carmichael clearly has genuine affection for the characters he writes about, the characters he creates in his songs. And regardless of whether you see the, the old man in the rocking chair or the small fry or, or Lazy Bones or New Orleans, the same way that he does, he draws you into his vision, which is heartfelt, genuine, and true. Just like Louis Armstrong, he finds the universal and writes about it. And um, that's pretty much it. I checked with the powers that be, and they gave me the go-ahead to play one more clip. Oh, this is just showing that uh, Hoagie hosted Louis Armstrong's 70th birthday party in Los Angeles. And since Catherine couldn't be here, here she performs Hoagie Carmichael's Eventide. And thank you very much. And uh, we'll, we'll continue with uh, a song that Hoagie Carmichael wrote, uh, especially for Louis Armstrong.
Farber on tennis saxophone, John Eric Kelso on trumpet, Dan Block on clarinet. Once again, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Big hand for Mr. Paul Kahn. Great presentation on tolerance. And uh, the, uh, speaking of tolerance, we got a shout out for the ladies, Anita O'Day, and of course, Mae West. Once again, Mr. Paul Kahn, everybody. <laughs> and in a few minutes, we have John Swenson. We're going to keep uh, that great jazz music and Mr. Armstrong's legacy alive right here. Thanks for coming. Hello, this is Robin Barnes, the songbird in New Orleans. Welcome to the 19th annual Satchmo Summerfest, presented by Chevron and the Hilton Satchmo Legacy Stage. This event is produced by French Quarter Festivals Incorporated, a nonprofit organization showcasing New Orleans culture and heritage since 1984. This event is made possible through the sponsorship of community minded organizations and the sale of Avita, Jack Daniels, Sonoma Couture, Corbell, Tequila Heradora, Finlandia, Pepsi, Aquafina, Bubbly, Bayou Rum, French Market Cold Brew, Louisiana Iced Tea, and Festival Merchandise, which helps pay for great entertainment, security, sanitation, recycling, EMS, and production costs. Please support your festival by purchasing from our beverage and merchandise booths. Do your part to keep the festival clean by using recycling and trash containers on site. And support our recycling effort by purchasing a reusable souvenir cup at our beer and cocktail booths. And please, enjoy responsibly. Special thanks to the Satchmo Legacy Stage contributors, Hilton, Harris, New Orleans, Joseph K. and Inez Eichenbaum Foundation, Ella Fitzgerald Charitable Foundation, Barbershop Harmony Society, the Fertel Foundation, Richie and Vicky Norigian, and Andrea Duplessis. And thank you to all sponsors, including Chevron, Brown Foreman, Abita Brewing Company, GE, Fidelity Bank, WWL TV, Offbeat Magazine, and so many more. Pick up a schedule for a full listing of all performances, events, and the culinary lineup. Go grab a bite before the next act begins and stop by the merchandise tent to purchase the official Satchmo Summerfest poster, shirts, and souvenirs. Enjoy the 19th annual Satchmo Summerfest presented by Chevron and happy birthday, Louis Armstrong. <laughs> 